Uh, Jesus uh, was an interesting person to listen to because uh, he wasn't boring. Uh, who wants a boring teacher? You ever have one of those? Oh, you have? Yeah. Uh, these are kind of a quasi-interactive service. So, um, yeah, Jesus, uh, he was not boring to listen to because uh, he wouldn't, like, quote the Mishnah and what different rabbis said. He just taught the word. Uh, but he didn't just do it that way. He used the uh, creative means by which to do this. So what he would do is he would tap into things that everybody understood, and then he would make spiritual concepts out of it. Uh, case in point, uh, Matthew 9, verse 17, when he wanted to talk about the difference between uh, Phariseeism and false religion, uh, he talks about old white skins and new wine skins. Uh, and everybody understood the wine can, skin concept because if you're walking around that day and time, this is like your version of a, a U.S. Army issue canteen. See? It's kind of like that. You slung it over your shoulder, you carried it around, you wanted a drink, it was in the wine skin. So when he's talking about uh, uh, true religion, false religion, uh, totally understood it if you lived in that culture because you all got the wine skin, con wine skin concept. Uh, creative way to teach. Uh, the other thing that Jesus did is uh, he, he loved farming and gardening. You know this? Because if you read a lot of his parables, uh, he taps into uh, things that everybody understood about agriculture uh, to teach them uh, great concepts. So when he wanted to teach people about how the gospel of Christ uh, germinates in the lives of people as it's cast out into the world or lack thereof, germination, uh, he used the image of a, of a farmer. Uh, who had a field that was plowed, uh, and he goes out through the, the field uh, casting his seed, uh, and he talks about how this particular uh, casting of the seed is really how the gospel is thrown out in the lives of different people. Some accept it, uh, some accept it for a little while, then reject it, etc. cetera. So um, I think I have a, a picture of this, if the video people are there. See? Ta-da! Uh, everybody in Israel would have got this because everybody would have either seen this or they, or they did this. And they're like, yeah, man, I only got like 50% germination of my seed. And Jesus is, uses that for the gospel. He also um, knew what weeds were, and perhaps this time of year, you do too. How's your yard? Stuff's coming up. It's like you didn't plan it, right? You're trying to kill it. What do you do? Call Marty. I don't know. Anyway, weed management. I did take a, a class uh, one time from uh, UC Davis uh, from a professor on, use, on weed management. Uh, just a weekend little intensive class. I'm, I'm into it. So I totally understand Jesus when he talks about weeds. So he, he, in Matthew 13, verse 24, when he wants to talk about uh, what the life's going to be like till he comes back, he talks about, well, the farmer casting his seed and weeds. And he says, uh, basically, that uh, when he comes back in his second coming to set up his kingdom, he's uh, going to wait till that point to separate uh, the wheat and the tares, the weeds. So he said, just let the weeds, the unbelievers, grow among the believers. And then when I appear, I will separate those who love me and those who rejected me. And then I'll set up the kingdom. Uh, he used weeds. Uh, then he tapped into the world of baking that all the ladies in the Jewish culture would have understood. Uh, if you've ever dropped yeast into a dough ball, what happens? And perhaps men know this too, because I like to cook. Um, what happens? It rises, or it's supposed to. If it just sits there, something's the matter. But he, he uses yeast to talk about the power of the, of the kingdom of God. So he says, I'm going to drop the gospel of the kingdom into the world, uh, and it's going to slowly spread, and eventually uh, it's going to take over the dough ball or the world. Uh, that's when he returns. So what looks really bleak to us as we watch our world unravel geopolitically and spiritually and morally, Jesus says, uh, well, be excited because I've dropped the yeast of the gospel into the world and it's going to permeate and the kingdom shall come one day. He did it with baking. Uh, and then another one, the last one I'll show you is uh, he tapped into fishing. Perhaps you like to fish. Fishing, if you're going out fishing, the wife's like, where are you going? It's a spiritual experience, isn't it? Because uh, they use nets. And so in Matthew 13, verses 47 to 51, Jesus used fishing uh, to talk about how at the end of the age, when the angels uh, uh, bring in the catch, uh, they throw the net out into the world and bring everybody in. And there's going to be good fish, bad fish, believing fish, unbelieving fish. And it's all metaphorical to relate to how he establishes his kingdom. So when you're listening to him talk, he's like, what's he talking about? He's talking about farming. He's talking about fishing. He's all over the map. Now, Usually in a sermon, I'll drop in some kind of weird analogy and, and ask you, how does that relate to spiritual things? And the answer is, it, it always relates, right? No matter what it is. And so what we're going to do today is I, I'm going to go based on that motif, what Jesus did, I'm following his lead, because if Jesus would have been uh, on the planet, he would have tapped into cartoons. <laughs> did you hear me? I told you it was going to be different. 
Yeah, see, he would have looked at a cartoon and he would have analyzed it from a spiritual perspective and then made spiritual application out of it that would have totally mess up your ability to enjoy the cartoon. So what I want to do is take an old cartoon, the, one of the biggest grossing cartoons of all time, uh, The Incredibles, and make a Mother's Day sermon out of it. Is it possible? Yes, we're going to do it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, this superhero family, uh, and they, boy, they have issues, and they have dysfunction. That's for another day. Uh, but the, if, how many have actually watched this cartoon? How many have watched it more than one time? <laughs> yeah, I've probably seen it 30 times. I mean, when you've got kids, when you've got grandkids, when you're just bored and want to watch something cool, this is it. Um, remember, and watch it from a spiritual perspective. That's what we're going to do. So uh, if you haven't watched it, let me give you kind of the, the premise of the cartoon, the movie. Um, the Incredible Family, the, the heroes. There's a bunch of them. Uh, they're out of jobs because when they go to rescue people, there's usually like collateral damage. They break stuff. And so the world eventually gets tired of them breaking stuff. And so they, they make them all go into like early retirement, hang up their special costumes. They can't do all their superhero stuff anymore. Uh, and so they end up having just mundane lives and jobs because they're not superheroes anymore. So the one family, the incredible family, is uh, at the head of the list of the family is Bob Parr, Little Waist, Little Legs, Massive Upper Body, like most men in our church. Uh, Bob Parr, uh, known for his feats of strength. Now he's, he's relegated to a desk job. It's boring. I think it's an insurance company. It's unbelievable. Uh, his wife, Elastigirl, you got to love the name because boy, she can go anywhere. Longest reach of all time. Can go into all, she's elastic, basically. Uh, she's, a, she's a housewife taking care of the children, not rescuing uh, people from criminal activity. Um, they have three children. Children's names are Violet. What can she do? She can disappear like most teenagers do. Uh, she can disappear and she can also put up a force field around her. It's amazing. And then have a little boy, what's his name? Dash, heavy on the fact that he can dash all right. He's so fast you can hardly see him move. It's amazing. Uh, they won't let him go out for football for obvious reasons. <laughs> no one could catch him. Um, and then they have a little, little baby. It's my favorite, Jack Jack. And what does Jack Jack do? He just kind of turns into fire. I mean, he's just... It's amazing. I love watching. I just crack up every time I watch Jack Jack. But to think of the family. So they're kind of in retirement, can't do their thing anymore. Now, with that in mind, what in the world could we say about mothers on Mother's Day in light of the incredible family? Well, we can pose the question, what makes an incredible mother or a mom? What makes one? We were, what we're going to do, we're going to do the Jesus things. What did he do? He took something from the culture, analyzed it, made a spiritual principle, and applied it to life. That's totally biblical. That's what we're going to do. So th that's why it's a little different than what I normally do. So no Hebrew today, no Greek. Oh, okay. Come back uh, later, get another service. Uh, so what we're going to do is what makes an incredible mom. And so we're going to look at four principles from the movie, uh, looking at what the movie is, does in certain contexts and, and principalizing that. So as I look at the movie and analyze it from a spiritual perspective, principle number one for me as I think about a mom is this. She's three things. She's what? She's faithful, loyal, and boy, is she honest. She's honest. Uh, now, what you have to see here, it's the wedding scene that I'm going to show you at the beginning of the movie, because every mom starts out as a wife, right? And you kind of get a picture of what kind of mom she's going to be from what happens at the altar. So I want to show you uh, what happens at the altar, and then we'll make some comments about this, spiritual speaking. This is Bob showing up late to his wedding. Hey, is the night still young? You're very late. How do I look? Good? Oh, the mask. You still got the mask. Showtime. Showtime. Robert Parr, will you have this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? You're late. When you, you asked me if I was doing anything later, I didn't realize you'd actually forgotten. I thought it was playful banter. It was playful banter. Cutting it kind of close, don't you think? You need to be more. Flexible. I love you, but if we're gonna make this work, you gotta be more than Mr. Incredible. You know that, don't so you? So long as you both shall live. I do. I pronounce this couple husband and wife. As long as we both shall live, no matter what happens. See how spiritual that is? Now let's think about that from a spiritual perspective. Uh, from the mother, what makes an incredible mother? Principle one, she's She's faithful, she's loyal, and, and she's honest, and she's on time. 
I've done weddings for 32 years. I can tell you when I put a wedding together, I did two weddings in the last couple of weeks. I planned another one this week with another couple. It's kind of wedding season. So I can tell you from doing weddings um, that when you're at the, the vow stage, like the, in the movie, if, if I was the priest, this is like three quarters of the way into the wedding. He's really late, isn't she? Isn't he? I mean, he's late. So when you think about an incredible mother, well, she starts out as an incredible wife at the altar because she confronts him. Men, did you get confronted by your wife right before the vows? Probably not a good thing. I have never, ever, ever had a couple in front of me while I'm trying to do the vows have them have an argument like this. Un unbelievable. So uh, what does she do? She, so she lovingly admonishes him because she loves him. And she wants to start out, you know, on a good foot. And his reply to her is, well, you just need to be more flexible. Uh, bad guy thing to say, right? So she loves him enough to admonish him. Now, this is a biblical concept because if your wife, who's going to be the mother of your children, knows how to admonish you, she's going to know how to admonish your children, which is a good thing. Uh, admonishing means that she loves you enough to tell you what she needs to tell you. Uh, and she knows what's best for you, Correct. So she's going to give you an attitude adjustment. Have you ever had an attitude adjustment by the mother of your children? Have you? Yes. I, only one man in the entire church. I'm afraid to say. Uh, now, she's, is she here with you? Yes. Praise God for you. Yeah. You just earned major points. Romans 15, 14 says this about admonishment. And concerning you, my brethren, I, I myself also am convinced that you, are, you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able also to admonish one another. The word admonishment, I won't tell you the Greek word because I told you we weren't doing Greek, right? The word to admonish means, in the original text, means to warn or to correct. Who doesn't want a wife, the mother of your children, who can look at your wayward behavior and help correct you because she loves you enough to tell you what she needs to say? Uh, Dr. Gene Getz, uh, who taught at Dallas Seminary when I was there, says this about that word admonishment. He says, there's no greater sign of love than being willing to risk rejection in broken relationships with others. He says, and if admonishment is done in the right spirit with the right motive using the appropriate method, the person who's not living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ usually can sense the risk that you're taking. He says, though that person may have difficulty acknowledging it at the moment, no kidding, deep down he really knows Someday he will probably thank you for your love that you as a wife, the mother of the children, had the gumption, the courage to say what needed to be said in an uncomfortable situation to help get him on a better path. Uh, what's the principle of a, of a great mother, an incredible mother? Number one, she is faithful to the word of God uh, and to her family. She's loyal to God and to his word and to her family. And she is completely honest to where she has to say what needs saying. Point two. Uh, she disciplines the disobedient. That's an incredible mother. She disciplines the disobedient. Now, in the movie, their son, Dash, remember, he can move really fast. Uh, I won't show you the clip. It's super funny, but uh, he's sitting in class, uh, and he's able to take a tack and put it on the teacher's chair when the teacher stands up and get back to his seat, and the teacher never sees it. And so the teacher sits on the tack. And so, you know, so the teacher finally figures out it's got to be him. And so he, the, the room has a video camera, so they videotaped. And so he takes a dash with his mother, last the girl, to the office with the principal, rolls the video evidence to show, I think I see this kid moving. I don't know how he's doing it, but I think it's him putting the tack. Well, the mother knows it's totally him. And so uh, he's c confronted over his uh, sinful behavior. Uh, notice what happens at the dinner table when, well, later in the evening. I don't know if this ever happened to you. You were out of line during, during the day as a kid and you get to the dinner table. That's where a lot of like family discussions happen where your parents try to help you. Uh, so it's a little bit longer, but notice what happens at their dinner table and think about what the mother's doing here uh, of behavior you might want to emulate as being one who disciplines the children. Notice what she does. You're making weird faces again. You make weird faces, honey. Do you have to read at the table? Uh -huh. Yeah. <sighs> Smaller bites, Dash. Yikes. Bob, could you help the carnivore cut his meat? <sighs> Ow. Dash, you have something you want to tell your father about school? Uh, um, well, he dissected a frog. Dash got sent to the office again. Good. 
Good. No, Bob, that's bad. What? He has Dash issues. Dash got sent to the office again. What? What for? Nothing. He put a tack on the teacher's chair during class. Nobody saw me. I could barely see it on the tape. They caught you on tape and you still got away with it? Whoa. You must have been booking. How fast do you think you were Bob, going? we are not encouraging this. I'm not encouraging. I'm just asking how fast you... Honey! Right. First a car, now I gotta pay to fix a tape. The car? Oh, what happened to the car? Here, I'm getting a new plate. <clears throat> so, how about you, Vi? How was school? Nothing to report. You've hardly touched your food. I'm not hungry for meatloaf. Well, it is leftover night. We have steak, pasta. What are you hungry for? Tony Reidinger. Shut up. Well, you are. I said shut up, you little insect. Well, she is. Do not shout at the table. Honey? Kids, listen to your mother. <laughs> yeah. Eat it. We were having Tony Loaf. That's it! Hey! Stop it! 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 it! You sit out! You sit out! You pay for that! Ow! Ow! He's clueless. We'll talk about him on Father's Day. Yeah. Jay Paladino, longtime advocate of superhero rights, is missing. Gazer beam. Bob, it's time to engage. Do something. Don't just stand there. I need you to intervene. You want me to intervene? Okay. I'm intervening. I'm intervening. Sister, why let go of your brother? I told you there was spiritual content if you pay attention. I would say this little family has issues, don't they? And kind of at this point in the movie, you're thinking, I think the mom's kind of helping hold things together, correct? Yeah. Yeah. The dad needs some fine tuning. So you can still, she's admonishing him, you know, because she needs his assistance, uh, men, the mother of your children needs your assistance to come along uh, and help with the children. But uh, so she's still admonishing him. But uh, boy, does she waste no time getting right into the sinful activity of the son, right? I mean, no sooner do they sit down than boom, she's, do you, did, your son has to tell you about something today. Uh, and, and so this is a, a mother in action. She's a disciplinarian. She wants to take care of the issue right at hand. Because if she doesn't deal with the issue of a sinful son right away, well, he gets away with it. Well, it's not going to be better for her later. So she wants to stay on top of that. Uh, now, her two children, Dash and Violet, are fighting it out, and she uses her long arms to grab them, maybe like your mom used to do, and put you in your chair and basically tells you don't move, and the fight continues, etc. You know, my, my sister Marla um, didn't come clean of stabbing me with a fork at dinner until we were in our... 50s. <laughs> Kid you not. She would stab me in the ribcage. I would retaliate. My dad would retaliate. And I couldn't defend my case because I had no grounds to stand on because she was just pure as a driven snow. Um, anyway, she finally came clean. I felt so much better. My dad was in absolute shock. You used to stab him? Yes. Uh, but thank God for godly parents who step in and they do what a parent needs to do. That's discipline the children. This is a biblical concept. Uh, Proverbs 29:15 says this, the rod and the reproof give wisdom. Notice the contrast. But a child who gets his own way brings shame to his, uh, to his mother. Because if, if, if Elastigirl would have let the child just do what he wanted to, then eventually, if he disrespected the mother, he's going to disrespect a teacher, a police officer, anybody else in authority, which is probably what's wrong with the United States today. You need more mothers stepping in going, you're not going to act like that. And so the, she steps in to help, uh, help uh, Dash get his act together. Um, Proverbs 19, 18 is another one uh, that a great mom knows. Uh, discipline your son, I love this, while there's hope. You don't want your mom looking at you going, there is no hope for you. Uh, discipline your son while there is hope and do not, I love this, do not desire his death. Yeah, yeah, who has not ever thought of that? I brought you into the world. You know, it's not in the Bible, but what is the statement again? I brought you into the world and I can take you out of the world. And then they don't mean it literally, but you get the concept. If your mom's talking like that, you better get your act together, right? Because your mom loves you and an incredible mom is not afraid to say what needs to be saying. So uh, have you ever done the dash thing uh, to where you probably shouldn't have done that uh, and you got in trouble for it? Uh, I did many times. I was the strong-willed child. 
Uh, and my mom helped me to not be the strong-willed child uh, by uh, disciplining me. i give you a case in point. Uh, they coveted a uh, teddy bear cookie jar. Uh, remember green stamps? Yeah. You saved those up to infinity, and you bought cool stuff. And I think that's how she bought the, the teddy bear cookie jar when I was, I don't know, five or six years old. I remember when refrigerators were round. I'm dating myself. Remember? Remember? And you couldn't set much stuff on it because it would fall off. So she put the teddy bear cookie jar on top of the refrigerator, realizing there's no way we're going to be able to get up there because we're like five and six years old. I was a climber. And she no sooner left and put the cup of the cookies in the cookie jar, I made a surveillance of the kitchen and found out I could probably push a chair over there and I could probably get my little hand on the foot of the teddy bear cookie jar. And if I get him to come toward me off the rounded edge, I'll just catch him. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I got up there, my little five, six-year-old body, stretched out as far as I could, got my little pinky on his toe, began to pull it toward me, and I could feel him starting to slide. And I was getting ready to catch him as he went by me at lightning speed. <laughs> and <laughs> poof, blew up all over the kitchen floor. It was a linoleum. Remember that cement slab, little linoleum squares? Everybody had the same color, basically. Remember when you grew up and there was no selection? It was kind of like that. And it just blew up everywhere. Cookies everywhere, teddy bear everywhere. My mother has reminded me many times in my lifetime of breaking her coveted green stamp cookie jar. Um, Now, what happened was uh, when my father came home that night, uh, we had dinner right next to the refrigerator where the coveted cookie jar had hit the floor. Uh, And that's kind of like where my dad sat. So when my dad came in, he came came home as a federal officer with a gun belt and a weapon and bullets and the whole shebang. That got your attention as a child quickly. And so as he's getting all that uh, weaponry off, getting ready for dinner, uh, we sit down and I have one of these discussions like you know, with last girl with her, you know, her, her family, uh, Al, we need to talk about Marty. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, I am the man that I am today because my mother was not afraid at dinner to have those discussions to help me uh, to learn how to be obedient. Because remember, if I can't follow the rules in my home, I'll not follow the rules in society. So... Point number three, Thank, thanks God for those kind of women. Point three, she's tuned in and not tuned out, namely to her husband's life. So a uh, little bit of, about uh, this, the situation. Uh, later on in the movie, her husband wants to get back into being a, an incredible uh, hero. And so he, be, unbeknownst to his wife, starts doing like side jobs. Of, of, and he eventually gets uh, invited to, to go to an island uh, uh, to be a, an incredible uh, hero there on the island. He just doesn't realize that Syndrome, who's really like Satan, uh, wants to lure him there to get rid of him. Because if you watch the movie, uh, Syndrome, and Syndrome was a little kid uh, that came to him and wanted to be uh, like a, a superhero wannabe, but uh, Bob kind of blew the kid off. So the kid's feelings were hurt. It becomes Syndrome, this evil thing. Uh, and so in the movie, uh, Syndrome has taken out Psychware, uh, Eversea or Macroburst, Hypershock, uh, Blazestone, Downburst, Tradewind, Gamma Jack. He's taken them all out, all these superheroes. Now he's got his eye on Mr. Incredible and his family. And so he's lured him to this island, false pretense, and he's going get to get rid of him there. His wife eventually connects all the dots uh, uh, to figure out her husband's been doing something behind her back. She finds out that he's on this island and it's in a dangerous situation. So she gets an airplane, a jet, she flies it, and, and then she gets the kids with her. They go to rescue the husband. Man, I must stop and ask you, how many times has the wife of your children rescued you? See, a godly mother steps in and goes, husband's in a bad situation, I need to step in. The children, they need to help. So let's look at the part when they're on the island, when they're all captured by syndrome, uh, and, and see what happens uh, as the mother's got the whole team there to help the husband. I'm sorry. This is my fault. I've been a lousy father, blind to what I have, so obsessed with being undervalued that I undervalued all of you. Dad? Shh, don't interrupt. So caught up in the past that I, I... You are my greatest adventure, and I almost missed it. I swear, I'm gonna get us out of this safely well, if Well, it... I think Dad has made some excellent progress today, but I think it's time we wind down now. Ta-da! Uh, then they go on to take on Syndrome and, and basically save the world. But it took the whole family unit, right, to save Dad? And they're having that little group therapy session. And he's making so much progress, isn't he? He's moving from dysfunction to function. It's awesome. 
Uh, when I'm watching this, I'm thinking about 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, where Peter says this. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Why? Your adversary, who's that? The devil. He prowls around like a roaring, roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. What you're experiencing is nothing new, but it's, it, it, you gotta, you got to get clued up. you got to check in. you got to be alert. So when, when Bob was not clued in and alert, thank God his wife was, see? So the wife, being a godly woman uh, of his children, steps in along with the children to deliver him from a bad situation. This is an amazing woman. This is an incredible woman. Uh, so she pays a close, close attention uh, to, I would say, to who his friends are. Because sometimes a man can have the wrong friends in his life. And he, she can step in and say, honey, I think we need to talk about who your, who your friends are. Uh, she pays close attention to how things go at his job. Why? Because she talks to him. She knows what he's facing, pressures that he's under, et cetera, and she can uh, hold him accountable and help deliver him from bad situations. And she does love to talk to him. He might be the kind of guy that comes and sits down at the table with the newspaper or the iPad today, but she's like, hey, 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 hey we, we need to talk. She wants substantive conversation. So she knows how to help him because she has a relationship with him. What kind of uh, woman are you? Hopefully it's the kind of woman that when you see those in your life, like a husband, that's going a bit off the rails morally, spiritually, that you love them enough to step in to say, uh, hey, I, I'm tuned into your life and I need to help you get back on where God wants you to go. Um, thank God for women like that. Thank God for mothers like that because they help a husband and they also help children, which leads to point four, my last point. She protects not only the husband, she protects the children. So toward the end of the movie, uh, Syndrome, who's like who? Satan, uh, he's not just going after the husband. I mean, he's, he's, you're going to see in this episode, he's going after the children. Uh, and he has a robot that he uh, builds and he launches the robot against the U.S. city. Uh, and he's going to have the robot destroy the city. Uh, and then he's going to then come and destroy the robot to make himself like the ruler, the new superhero. The only problem is uh, he has a family in his way to stop the robot. And that family is Bob and Elastigirl and their two children. And notice uh, as the robot is unleashing his wrath upon the city, uh, what happens to the children, how the, the dad and the mother react in this clip. If we work together, you won't have to be. I don't know what will happen. Hey, we're superheroes. What could happen? <laughs> You just want to go home and watch the movie, don't you? Now, now, now think about this. Uh, she, she's protecting her children, isn't, isn't she? That's exactly what she's doing from this menacing robot. I mean, think about the culture in which we live of all the things you as a mother have to protect your children from. I mean, think about it. I mean, bad friends that your, your kids think are good friends, a bad girlfriend that maybe your son shouldn't be dating. I mean, a terrible influence. Maybe teachers that are trying to brainwash them into ideology that's godless. I mean, the list is endless. Drugs. I mean, my, one of my good friends, Paul Milner, uh, OD'd on heroin when we were in ninth grade. I mean, how old are you then? 14, 15? I mean, there's all kinds of influences that come against you and you need a mother who can come alongside you to say, hey, we need to protect you. So what does she do? As the robot's trying to destroy her children, to be like Satan, the mother comes in there along with the help of the dad and, and pulls him out of a bad situation. See, that's an incredible mother, a mother who sees what's going on in the lives of her children and does what needs to be done to, to help and assist them. So she's the kind of mother that would pray for her children, as my mom did, without ceasing, as my wife did for our kids. Uh, she's a mother uh, who's diligent to teach uh, her children God's ways. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, uh, Moses was told by God to write these words. 
He says, you shall teach them the law of God uh, diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Translated, wherever you go, whatever you're doing, you should be analyzing life through the lens of what does the word of God say? Because if this is what the word of God says, this is how we live. So he's saying, you're fishing, you're at a baseball game, you're at baseball practice, soccer practice, taking music lessons, whatever. You as a parent should know the word of God and be putting that in the life of your child, helping them relate it to the world in which they live, because that will help them hold back against the robot trying to destroy them. So what does our culture need? Well, those kind of incredible moms who step in to save the, save the child. She's like that. So you want to be an incredible mom? Uh, we've seen what they are like in some degree. Uh, but I want to first uh, talk about, before we close, uh, what, a, what does an mo- incredible mother sound like? So I'm going to give you a few sound bites to see if these sound familiar, of what they sound like. All right? You ready? Yes. You're yes? Okay. Um, an incredible mother talks like this. I am not asking you. <laughs> what say you? I'm telling you. That's kind of mosaic, isn't it? So she's coming across as an authoritarian who's got herself together. She knows exactly what you need to know. Here's another thing an incredible mom might say. If all your friends jumped off a bridge, (laughs) what's the the other part of that? Would you follow them? You know, it's honey. I mean, peer pressure. Don't give in to it. Don't go where the way they're going. That's an incredible mother. Here's another one. Um, One day you're going to thank me. I know that's not in the Bible, but you kind of get the gist of it. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Mom, for when I blew up the cookie jar, you, you disciplined me, and then Dad disciplined me, and I think you disciplined me again. Uh, I got the atten- you got my attention. Uh, here's another one. Um, where'd you hear that? That's telling you, it's like all the stuff your friends tell you might not be worth listening to. And one more. Uh, this, is, this is one's really kind of interesting. Uh, I, I remember this one in my life with sis, my sisters. How, how can you say that you have nothing to wear when your closet is full of clothes, <laughs> etc.? Uh, that's what a, that's what an incredible mother sounds like. She's trying to help you navigate to be at a point of greater wisdom. So thank God for them. But what does an incredible mother look like? Okay, so we're going to review, right? We are. Point one: she is faithful, loyal, and honest. Two. She disciplines the disobedient because sin's a real thing. Number three, she's tuned in, not tuned out to what's going on in the life of her husband. And number four, she protects her children from what syndrome the devil's trying to do. That's a godly woman. Good to have you in God's house today. It is Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day. Hope you have a great day. It's now time for all of you to go home and the men are cooking, right? Let's pray. God, thank you for today and the opportunity to just uh, look at the scripture from a different creative perspective. And uh, and the scriptures teach us that your word does not ever come back void. And so you will bless the things said today uh, to accomplish your purposes for eternity. Uh, Bless the mothers who've come today. It may be a great day where they are honored by their family. In Christ's name, amen.